Welcome, everybody. Welcome once again to the Nefesh Podcast. I believe this is episode 31. I'm starting to lose count, but I'm just excited that you are here, and I'm really excited for this guest this week, uh, Mrs. Tiffany Berg. Uh, did I say that right? You Berg? did. Absolutely. All right. Uh, a wife, mother, student, pastor, cohort advisor. Lots I mean, a lot of hats. <laughs> Just sent your son off to, I was about to say military school. That's the wrong thing. No, sent your son off to military. Yes, Uh, the Marines, Paris Island. The Marines. Yes, yes. yes. My dad was in the Marines, so that's the the tough stuff. Oh, yeah. Uh, But you're going to be sharing with us one of the ministries, the ministry. Well, you're involved in a couple, but uh, the one of the really important ministries that you're involved in. Um, And, you know, as you and I were talking, you're out here in California visiting and and recording a a course. And just as you were sharing, I just felt the need to, as much as possible, more people to hear about what you're doing. And I just, I I love it. And I love, you know, all of the all of the the impact that your ministry is having. But why not uh, go ahead and first just share, uh, share a little bit about yourself. So, yeah, it's Tiffany Berg, and a lot of my identity, I say super south Louisiana. Super south. Super south. 15 minutes south, and you're hitting water. <laughs> so, born and alligators, raised, right? Yes, and alligators. Okay. Absolutely. There's right. definitely alligators. Um, but, yeah, definitely. So, born and raised, um, and still live there now with my husband, Jai, and our three children, Carter, Caroline, and Coben. Um, so, yeah. Um, than all the hats we talked about that I wear. Um, so I am an elementary teacher. Um, I am also the cohort advisor for HOMA for SUM. And then I am a student again at Liberty University going for clinical mental health counseling. Wow. And then um, last but definitely not least is my work that I do with a nonprofit called mm-hmm. Free International. And that has to do with uh, sex trafficking, ch- specifically more child sex trafficking Mm -hmm. and missing and exploited kids. Wow. Now, Faith International is a ministry. People can look it up. It's a ministry through. Yeah. So free. Yeah. Free International. International. Yes. So definitely. Yeah. We have a website. And then Free International is actually a ministry um, connected with the Assemblies of God. So it's part of their intercultural um, ministries. Okay. So, yeah, absolutely something that they can look up. Yeah. So, yeah. So how did you... I, you know, human trafficking is something that I really wasn't aware of. I don't know whether it was naivete or just kind of a out of my awareness. You know, I um, had done mostly ministry in the United States. And I know as you're going to share that it actually is irrelevant because the United States is big in human trafficking, yes, unfortunately. Yes. But more in church ministry. I mean, I did missions trips, but church yeah. ministry, youth ministry. And it wasn't something that was on my radar until right. about 12 years ago, a good friend of mine, uh, 13 years ago, actually, a good friend of mine started uh, this kind of uh, fundraiser for it that we actually adopted at, at a church that I was a part of and, mm-hmm. and really began to use it as an opportunity to raise awareness uh, regarding human trafficking and, and again, used it as a, as a fundraiser. Uh, tell us a little bit about some of the statistics regarding just broadly human trafficking. Absolutely. So, and, and I think that it's it's worthy to mention that, you know, the academic discourse when it comes to our churches and it comes to sex trafficking is definitely not there. Right. Um, and I think that it's a it's an area that we have heard, whether whether you know Christian or secular, whatever. Um, it's something that we've heard about, mm. but it's it's how does the church even connect to something that that just seems so deep and so right. dark and so sinful right and so yeah louisiana i mean um you, the united states altogether ranges probably third to fourth in the world when it comes to um people who are being trafficked so human trafficking is trafficking, not yeah. something that is happening over there. Absolutely not. So our executive director, Mike Bertel, um, the executive director for Free International, 
started a lot of his work in India. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of work that he was, he's, he's from the States, but a lot of the work that he was doing was mostly children who were being sold into brothels. And so, um, it was actually why he was there. Somebody mentioned America and, oh, wow, you're from America. It's so bad there. And he had this like moment of, wow. Like he didn't even know. No, that. not at yeah. all. And so as he started to realize more and more mm. how much it, it really is happening here, he started in New York originally and then moved his family down to uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. And so that's what he, that's where he stationed out of, but he's our executive director. He and his wife, Denise Bortel of Free International. So he saw it first in India yes. and then realized how great the need was in his own backyard, exactly. essentially, yes. in the United States. In the United States. Now, way back when I was first introduced to it, uh, somebody was telling me the statistic that more people are involved in some type of enslavement in human trafficking or, or slavery. More people today are enslaved than in all of human history combined. Is that is that true? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and I think that the reason that we were not always forced to really consider slavery is because I think that our our idea mm -hmm. of slavery altogether looks a certain way. Sure. Oh, there's a, you know, there's a gross amount of people and, and they're being whipped and they're mm -hmm. being forced to do. Um, and so our, I think that the definition of slavery, as far as what even how I felt before getting involved... Sure what I saw slavery to be mm. and the reality of what slavery is differs. Yes. And, and even, even the concept of trafficking, sure. What people originally, I had this idea that it looks like putting these people in the back of a U-Haul, mm. taking them across the state mm -hmm. and forcing them um, to have sex with somebody. That, that was my thought of what sex trafficking looked like. Right. And so within our church, we, we support, we are very missions um, heavy church. I go to church at Bible Assembly of God in Homa, Louisiana. And Jody Dice, um, who is another missionary with Free International, actually came and spoke. Mm. And so... I'm, I'm sitting down listening to him preach and the entire time I just started to weep wow. because I just, my heart was so broken with the stories that he was telling. And then the reality of, wait, he's a U.S. missionary. This wow. is happening in the U.S. Wow. Broke my heart even more. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of what started um, just this, this thought of, all right, God, how do I fit into this? Because I'm, I'm so broken about this. Yeah. But what, what can I do? Right. You know, and so that kind of started the conversations between Jody and I. Um, Jody also with his wife and a team does um, Say Something Assemblies. And so that's where he originated from. With Say Something Assemblies, going into the schools and talking more about bullying mm -hmm. and suicide awareness. Mm -hmm. And so he was kind of faced with sex trafficking on a more personal level. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of what started his involvement as well. Did that come out of his doing assembly work? Um, Not necessarily. Okay. It was it was definitely more of um, at home issue. Something it was that, it became personal. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And so he got involved. Um, his involvement kind of started with the Super Bowl in New Orleans. Mm. I, think, I think it was. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, I love it. I love the way you say. <laughs> I know. So many people say so many New, New Orleans. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think that was probably in 2013, maybe. Wow. Um, is when he started to, to realize, I can definitely take this side and and add that into our school assembly. So mm -hmm. now the focus is more suicide awareness and sex trafficking awareness. What did he see at the Super Bowl down in New Orleans that gripped him? That what did he what did he come in contact with? So basically, whenever we have a huge event in America, mm -hmm. whether that be the Super Bowl or the pro games or just other things that we're celebrating. Anytime you have an influx of people that are going into the cities, you're starting to see more movement within those who are mm -hmm. being trafficked, whether that is people taking people from other states and bringing them into this area. And unfortunately, people, how can I say this? It's almost like when things like this are happening, we, we see this in Mardi Gras a lot in New Orleans. It's like everything goes. Wow. All of a sudden, people's inhibitions of mm -hmm. what they would normally perceive to be okay or not okay 
go out the window and then they start this, you know, drinking and, and just inhibition altogether. There maybe they have traveled and so they're not around people that would hold them more accountable. Right. So anyway, that's kind of how we start seeing. So that people are at the Super Bowl and maybe doing things that they wouldn't normally, normally do. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so you start seeing a little bit more activity and, and just not activity when it comes to sex trafficking. When we think of drugs, mm -hmm. you know, the trafficking of drugs is, is going to be more prevalent during those times as well. Right. Um, crime, we see an increase in crime. So just all together, when you get an influx of people who are coming in and they're celebrating and they're drinking and they're trying things that maybe they never done before, hmm. you know, starts to kind of all those inhibitions kind of get thrown out the window. Right. And so that is why, um, originally we did, um, what's called the big search. Okay. That is a, like a free international term, the big search. And that is when we, um, actually conduct searches, um, it, it used to follow the Super Bowl, but logistically that got difficult okay. because we, Definitely, we are like a task force. So, okay. and then we work alongside law enforcement that is already in place, that already has the jurisdiction within those areas. And so we never step over law sure. enforcement ever. So there's connections, which is really great. I mean, with this type of ministry, there's connections with law enforcement already set up. They know Correct. that you're going to be there. Correct. And so what does, well, let me actually, if I can go back. What are some of the aspects that are involved in human trafficking or sex trafficking that we wouldn't normally associate with? So you mentioned before that, you know, earlier you might might have thought sex trafficking is taking somebody from across the state or across the globe and forcing them to to have sex or be sex slaves right. or whatever. What what are all of the components that are involved in human trafficking or sex trafficking. So we'll talk about just the different ways maybe that, that we see trafficking. One is from their own family members, 12% okay. of CSEC. And that's a word that we'll use. It's commercially sexually exploitation of children. Wow. CSEC. Which means um, they are sold. They are being sexually exploited. So commercial meaning to others. Okay. Um, sexually exploitation of children. Wow. And so 12% of cases are actually committed by family members. And then we see um, a large influx when we think about children who have run away. So um, one third of homeless or runaway youth are lured into sex trafficking with, within 48 hours of leaving wow. the home. And so when we think about that, when we are going to do a search, we don't go in and say, okay, who's being sex trafficked? Right. We're going in and looking for missing children. Wow. And so our fine director, his name is Brad Dennis. His um, expertise was intel in the Navy SEALs. Wow. Um, he did some work with the CIA. And so um, a large portion of where he started was mostly search and rescue. Okay. Until he was actually in California. And a case came up with a missing child. And so he actually stayed for a few weeks and worked alongside with the family. And unfortunately, this child was not found, but rather recovered. Oh. And she had been raped. Oh. And, and during that time is when things started to kind of shift for him. And then th the next big part of what happened is he's from Florida. And there was a child that was missing. And so he and a colleague go through her room. They find this book. Um, and, and what caused them to even go there before is that the mother was beaten and the child was taken. Mm. And so they go in and they start looking through her room and they find this book with numbers. And by this, and she was 13 years old. Oh. By these numbers were like these little five digit codes. So he calls it and realized that it's actually numbers to uh, basically a trafficking oh my gosh um hotline basically that she had and it was her little voice talking about the things that she would do and the amount of money that it would take for her to do these things so that, that this was something that she had set up correct on correct. her own on her own 
Oh and we'll talk gosh. about the statistics even when it comes to self self trafficking. Oh my gosh. And so he finds her, he did find her in a hotel with a 65 year old truck driver. And the saddest part about that is that she was actually one of her youth, one of his youth students oh my in gosh. church. And so when he realized, wow, this is, this is happening. Yeah. That's when the shifting kind of started to take place from only looking for children that maybe there may be a recovery for, mm. because that has been a very difficult thing in his life. Um, and that shifted to, okay, we need to start looking for missing kids. So our goal is not to go into a city just looking for sex trafficked. Our goal is to go into a city and look for missing children. Is that primarily what you do uh, or, or where you Correct. start? So yes. do you go in with um, children that you are specifically looking for? Correct. Okay. Correct. So we are given a list of children and, and it looks different in different cities. Mm -hmm. Um, in Pensacola, he lives there. So there was a lot of relationships. So the, the police were able to actually share, okay, he, this is who we have in our radar right now. Sure. And we were able to start searching for it that way. Um, Las Vegas, it looks a little bit different. They're coming in either from DHS, okay, which is their kind of their child protective services. Um, and some are actually coming from the actual list of uh, missing and exploiting children, mm -hmm. the National Center of Missing and Exploited Children. Okay. And so we compile a list of children and the very first thing that we start doing is doing intel. And a lot of that looks like open source information. So that could look like social media accounts. Mm -hmm. um, it could look like court documents, anything that's actually open source. So none of this requires really a, um, a super secretive sure. way of looking or like a warrant to get right, into correct. the personal records. Correct. Especially. And, and does it, yeah. And it could lead to sure. that of course, but, and that would be where the police involvement is super helpful. Sure. So we have a team that is kind of comprised of, um, we have retired FBI, retired DEA, wow. retired military, all branches, wow. retired law enforcement. Which can be so helpful, I imagine. Extremely helpful. I mean, they're bringing all of their resources. Exactly. Wow. And and a, and a huge part of Brad's heart is from being a veteran. Hmm. A lot of our military are trained to fight. Hmm. But then when they come back, he, he noticed that that loss of, Purpose? of will because, yeah, because... Yeah. They, this is what they've been trained to do. And sure. especially if they've been deployed multiple times, how sure. do I then transition to civilian life? But then what do I fight for now? Yeah. And so he, he's so amazing. And, and, and so he pulls those guys in and that's he's like, you want to reason the fight? Idea. Let's fight. Wow. This. Oh, so that's, 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 that's so a huge good. group. And, and, and there's lots of different nonprofits that are mm -hmm. coming together. So with Brad, he actually has call to rescue and his title for all of us are the shepherds. Mm -hmm. And that is his, his exact thought behind it was, we are going to leave everything behind and yeah. go search for the one. That's so good. Yeah. And so his heart behind it is just, it's, it's beautiful. Absolutely. And so when we're kind of, I guess, you know, quote unquote, that boots on the ground, he mm -hmm. is our operational manager. Um, now, outside of that, other people have different organizations. We have Chained, Unchained, okay. and he, and, um, Troy and okay. his wife, Tiffany. They actually sold most of their belongings, bought a, bought some property wow. and put a tiny house for them to live on and now have other tiny homes. And that is for um, survivors. Wow. Um, we have SWAT, which is the sports world against trafficking that, that has come in. Um, we have ORM. Um, so there's a couple of different of uh, nonprofits, that nonprofit you're... ministries that come together. So on a team, what it kind of looks like, is that you would have retired military. Okay. You would have law enforcement or okay. retired law enforcement or even active military, but military experience, law enforcement um, experience, a medic okay. because we're, we're needing to be safe. Wow. Um, two or three intel um, analysts and then a ministry leader. I, I just, it, it's just so incredible. I mean, you, you've got all these backgrounds who were used uh, for other purposes and you're bringing them together to save lives. And yes. so how many teams does he, is this going on all year? I know you just came back from Vegas Correct, on one, yes. but this is going on ongoing. It is. It is. Okay. So I go to Las Vegas. This was my second time going to Las Vegas with them. Um, it's, it's on a bigger scale when okay. we go to Vegas and sure. Vegas is always the trip that is, um, going on at the same time as the Super Bowl. Okay. 
So, right, so even though the Super Bowl was in was in Arizona, is that right? You guys were in Vegas because correct because of all the people who are coming for all the betting and everything like that. So we see a huge influx of people okay. who are coming to Vegas during that time. Okay. Um. So yeah. Um. But it it there are big searches that are happening in other cities. There, there's one this year that's going to be in Detroit. We're okay. going back to Pensacola. Um, and so, and then there's a few other ones that are on the calendar. So every couple of months, there's a big search happening. Yes. And so it consists of that team and I'm assuming the preparation beforehand, you're getting the names and you're going through the information. Yes. So we start Intel. So to go to Vegas, we started Intel about two or three weeks before. And, and, and here's the reality. Police are undermanned, Mm -hmm. underfunded. Mm -hmm. Right. And so for them to sit there um, and they do have their own intel guys, but when you're when you're thinking about dozens of missing yeah. children within your city, it takes hours of intel. Yeah. And so, especially if we don't have that much information to go off of, sometimes yeah. it's literally a name. Wow. And maybe a picture. Wow. And so when you're going off of that, very minimal um you need help. Yes, absolutely. And so even just with our efforts of being able to do intel, mm-hmm. there were children who were found even before we put boots on the ground there. Just by providing the intel. Just by providing the intel. Oh, and wow. so we we put together a workbook and everything that we put in this workbook is all permissible in court because we, you know, we are trained how right. to put in the information so that it can continue to be used. Sure. One, sometimes unfortunately we have repeat runaways. Mm. Um, and two, if for whatever reason we do not find that child, we're able to release that notebook, I mean that workbook, to the police and then they're they able to continue. use all of that. So they have family information, they have social uh, mm-hmm. media account mm-hmm. information. So there's a lot of information that they have. Yeah. And in Vegas, we had an amazing partnership. We have the director of the MGM security that was with us. We have an ER physician that was able to come in. We have licensed therapists Mm -hmm. that have come in. We had social worker cops that they have there that came in. We had school resource cops. We had Nevada Highway Patrol. So we had a lot of um, Homeland Security was there with us. The Attorney General was there with us. That's incredible. Yeah. And And all working together. Correct. Correct. So are you, I mean, are you... I picture this like, uh, I'm not picturing this like a movie. Like, are yeah. you literally going in with this big all group, like busting down the doors of these places? Or, I mean, I guess it looks different. It does. <laughs> it does. And so our our responsibility, not maybe responsibility, we're not going to kick down people's doors. Okay. We're, we're not SWAT. <laughs> right. And so, and, and we have to be respectful of every mm. jurisdiction sure. of, that we go to. Sure. And so our jurisdiction, basically, even though we do have law enforcement with us and we do have, talking about our team, military, we are basically going in as a civilian task force. Okay. And so, yes, while we get um, participation from the local police departments, we allow them, if, 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 if it comes to the point to where we have hard evidence of what's happening, then they can obtain the warrant and do to what needs in. to be done. Okay. We will never, we will never break the okay. law in sure. that respect. Sure. Now, listen, if there is somebody who is completely unsafe. Yes. Right. Our, our moral comp, you know, comp is, we, we're going to do. And you can see absolutely. It. Yeah, yeah. But that yeah. is, that is not really truly okay. the reality of what's really happening on, on a normal basis. And okay. so. We are very, very careful. Mm. Um, so what do some of those scenarios look like? So we did have one scenario this time when we went to Vegas where we actively rescued somebody mm. out of trafficking. Wow. I, I have to be very minimum with the sure, details. Of course. Um, but it kind of looked like getting her to a hotel, doing a switch, bringing her somewhere else. And now she is actually at a rehabilitation wow. program many, many, many miles away from sure. Las Vegas yeah. and getting the help that she needs. Unfortunately, she was a a, a child who was adopted, mm-hmm. um, but through an open adoption was able to find out who her biological parents were. And unfortunately, it was her biological mother who had been trafficking her for three wow. years. Oh, my God. And so we had actually saved her a couple of times. We, her name came across the last two years and this year. So this was year three. Wow. But 
she's 18 now. Okay. And so that kind of changes things because what we have to consider is that if we're in a, a city, we can't just take 15 year olds and of fly course. them somewhere else. Right. You don't have, there's the so much red tape and yeah. yeah, absolutely. And so, but once they're 18, mm-hmm. that becomes a little bit more easy sure. as far as the process goes. So did she, and, I, and again, I know you can't share right. a whole lot, but did she return because she wanted to, or was it her mom who went and tracked her down and got her back? No, I, cause she was, she was sent back to her adoptive parents and then she would leave. And I think, you know, we have this part in us that we want to know who our, our parents are, yeah, right? You know, there's this, this connection biologically. Right. And so I think that for her, having those feelings of um, maybe even abandonment and that mm-hmm. kind of like helped with those, some of those feelings, maybe. Sure. Maybe pleasing her mom. Correct. Uh, absolutely. To make a connection. Right. But then you have to consider the grooming yes. side of this, which, which sometimes looks like, and maybe not for a mother, but for a trafficker to mm-hmm. somebody who's being trafficked. At first, it looks like love. Mm. And a lot of these children, a large percentage. So I, I did a study recently and 100% of the kids who were in, it was it was a little over 200 kids that were in the DHS um, system. Every single one of them. So 100% of them admitted to having a missing parent. Wow. And these were, were the over 200 were... Children who were not only in DHS, but had been confirmed sex trafficked as well. And every single one of them had admitted to having at least one absent parent within the home. And so when when we start looking at those statistics Mm -hmm. and and the reality of those who are running away um, and how easily, you know, within those 48 hours, one third of them are being approached by a trafficker. And they're, and they're preying on the vulnerability of, I just want to be loved. Right. And so it starts off with just that, their, their idea of what love could look like. Mm. And there's gifts. Um, and there's a lot of uh, spoiling maybe. Mm. Um, but then that becomes few and far between as the, the sexual relationship with that person becomes maybe more rough and rough. Right. And not so much aftercare is being done. Right. Um, and so eventually maybe it looks like, well, if you love me, you'll have sex with my friends. Right. And then from there, it's like, well, if you love me, right. I need help supporting us. And wow. so you have to do this now to help us. Wow. Um, sometimes it looks like the trafficker getting them addicted to drugs. And so that becomes a driving mm-hmm. force is substance. And they you become know. the supplier. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And so um, there was actually um, a story that Brad told us with a, um, she was 13 years old and all night long they had to, because they had to compile enough evidence to not only be able to rescue this child, but then to prosecute the trafficker, which is a very difficult process actually. Why? Because of the grooming and because of the the trauma hmm. that's happening they won't always testify, testify. and so you f- and it and it's a difficult thing because do we wait till we physically watch it happen hmm. in this situation it was something that was being done on a grander scale so hmm. more surveillance needed to happen okay. and so all night long a car would pull up she oh, would gosh. look inside the car look back at the guy he would do a signal with his hat and then she would get into the car hmm. At the end of all of this, he prepares a crack pipe for her. And just as he goes to give it to her, he throws it on the ground and stomps on it. She gets on the bus. He gets on the bus. And that's where they felt it was most safe to do, um, to basically stop it. When they got her away from him, they realized that he was actually her cousin. Oh, my gosh. But then when he did ask her, he said, why were you denied the crack pipe? And she said, one of the times I didn't ask his approval with the amount of money that I was supposed to accept. 
Meaning the amount of money was less or more? Or? She was supposed to turn around and look for his signal and she just got into the vehicle. So that's why he said he wouldn't give it to her. Now you would think that this, this situation would be enough for her to be able to testify against him and she refused. The only reason they were able to really get him is because he had done it to her older sister who had kept it a secret. And so when she found out this happened to her little sister, she was the one who testified. Who, who testified. Yeah. And so in, in another part of what we have to look at with sex trafficking is that actually 31% of children who are being trafficked, it's because they're trafficking themselves. So 31% of children, for whatever reason, are doing this. Um, nobody is forcing them. Correct. Correct. It looks like 63% of those kids, um, advertise themselves online. Mm. Um, and 89% of contact with the online predator, it comes through chat rooms and instant messaging as well. So you have those two things happening to where they will, they will put themselves on the internet. Um, and some of these kids, it looks like this is what I know. Mom has done this. Mm. Um, Another side of this is, is just that need to, for, for some sort of affection, maybe, you know, like there's so many reasons that, that goes around this, but we, we did have a, in my experience, a higher percentage of children who were confirmed sex trafficked wow. during this trip in Vegas than my other trips before. The amazing thing. So Ashton Kutcher yeah. is somebody who advocates um, and really is, is part of the fight against mm -hmm. human trafficking. And so there is a program that he has helped put together and it's called spotlight. And so I'm able to take a picture of somebody that I believe may be running, um, escort or sex ads. Mm -hmm. And you're able to, um, upload that picture into this system. And not everybody has access to this sure. system, by the way. Sure. Um, but we're able to, to upload this picture into the system and then it runs every single escort or sex ad wow, and it's constantly changing. Yes. And it's constantly, but I mean, he has the money to, yes, to continue right. to improve the software. Right. Of course. And so, and then we are able to see then mm -hmm. if they are running ads or not. Um, and, and you can actually, you can use a phone number. So if you have a phone number, you're able to run that phone number and see if it's connected. Wow. And then not only does it do that, it will connect um, every other, so it'll bring up, if you find it in one website, mm -hmm. then it actually shows you co the connections of all the other websites they may be using. Wow. And so we've, we've used that before as well to, to find. People. Now, one of the things that you shared with me is that, and one of the things that you do is that you will call numbers. So where I, I the, one of the awful things about going to Vegas, I remember this was years ago. I haven't been in a, in a while. It was, it was yeah. like a Bible <laughs> Bible quiz ministry trip. And right. here we are walking down the street with, oh and of course, a strip. Yeah. Yeah. And you're just being handed. Just You are. And you know, it's funny. I take them. I take every one Do of you? them and I literally rip it up right there and I throw it on the ground. Oh, wow. <laughs> but there are numbers. Though, yes, right? there are numbers. And so there is a missional side. So not only... Our goal is not to just put, I mean, now this is a celebration. Every time we're able to put a found, yeah. a big red found yeah. on any poster that right. we have, there is right. always a celebration. Of we course. stop what we're doing and just celebrate that. Right. But the second part of what we do is to meet their needs mm. on the ministry level. And so that could look like getting them into more of a long-term treatment. That could look like returning them back to a family, seeing what the needs are within that family. Maybe it's food. Yeah. Maybe uh, this time we were delivering sofas and wow. furniture to a family that were just very impoverished, that just yeah. basically had enough money to get into a place, wow. but didn't really have enough money to furnish it. Sure. And so we're able to meet all of these other needs mm. that there may be there. Yeah. And so on alongside of that, there is the missional side, but on side of that, there is actual opportunity for people who would like to get involved that would do a flyer canvas mm -hmm. of, of different areas. Mm -hmm. They do like a cookout and invite okay. the community to come. Okay. Um, 
And then, like you were saying, there's another side to where we will actually call, just randomly call these numbers, these numbers, these and, escort and, numbers. And, and just say, you know, just want to let you know that you are loved and you are valued. Mm -hmm. And if you need help getting out, help is available. This is the number. You can call this number back if you need to get out. And, and it does happen sometimes that, that they will, yeah, will, they will respond. Yes. In, so when you're calling these numbers, are you getting actual people on the other line? Yes. And so I'm assuming that some of the common responses are, you know. No, no, up. I'm fine. I'm fine. Wow. And, and really, honestly, it's not a lot of hangups. It's no, I'm good or I'm fine, mm. you know. But you actually do get some people. Who, yes. Yes. Wow. Another thing that we do is that we will send gifts to massage parlors mm -hmm. because the reality is massage parlors, AKA brothels, mm -hmm. undercover brothels is what that looks like often. And so they'll put together gifts, but then they'll put like a small card yeah. of our information to where if they make the decision that they want out as well, that they can make that those phone calls. That Correct. They can call. Correct. Wow. Yeah. What has, how long have you been a part of this ministry? So actively for a little over a year now. Okay. Um, I started training before then. Um, the, the training that I was doing was more on, um, different sides of, of not just the, the sex trafficking work, but the search and rescue side mm -hmm. as well. And so it was just like a mixture of different things. Um, and then being trained to, for Intel mm -hmm. and, and knowing where to go and how to do that, because I mean, you have to protect yourself. And right. so, um, you know, how to even set up your computer properly and how to oh. have different accounts. That's not really your account, you know, yeah. your private account. Right. And so it's just setting all of these things up right. to safeguard the people who are doing this yeah. work. So what have you found? I, I just, it, it, it's heartbreaking and yet it's overwhelming the, the thought and the trauma that these children, especially the children, but also all of them are experiencing, how do you, how do you, how do others in this ministry manage not to just be overcome by, by such brokenness? Right. So the very first time that I went on a trip, I, I broke in the middle of it. Uh, I just, I was like, the reality of this is hitting so hard right now. Um, and, and when I left, I felt defeated. We mm -hmm. had, we had found a bunch of children. It was a, it was a great experience, but I left feeling defeated because I looked at the system wow. and I looked at a system that I fully believe is so broken and, and for the most part, doesn't work alongside to really come up with, with good uh, ways to really combat this. Yeah. I look at, I, I got frustrated with the legislative systems mm -hmm. and all the lawmaking systems. And I'm like, why, why when we're sitting in a first world country like America, right. do we have thousands mm -hmm. of homeless youth on the streets just in Clark County, which is your County? No, look, Clark County would be Vegas. Oh, Vegas, Vegas right, yes. right, right. Alone. Wow. I'm like, how is this a reality that wow. we have thousands mm -hmm. of homeless youth? Mm -hmm. How? how, how? Right. And so I became so overwhelmed by the system yeah. that I love feeling very defeated. And so I've done other searches throughout the year and then coming back to Vegas, which is our bigger search. Mm -hmm. So that's why I kind of reference Vegas more. Yeah. I started to realize that it's almost like looking when you're reaching people for Jesus. If you think about the billions mm. that are unsaved, right. it, it could you could feel very defeated in that. But right. if you think about one soul at a time yeah. that you go after right. and and you pray over because mm. it's not just intel. So when I got these names in my office, I have a shelf and I put a sticky note with each kid's names. And so every time I went into my office, I just placed my hand on that name. Yeah. And I'm just like, God, shine your light yeah. in dark places. Let them know that they're loved. Let them feel you in this right. moment. Show us where they are. Yeah. And, but then begin to soften their hearts because mm -hmm. when we find them, let them receive. They have to walk exactly. out. Otherwise, exactly. they will return. Exactly. And so this trip, I, I found myself now 
I mean, I was, it, it, it took a couple of days for me to kind of, because you're, you're doing this. So we typically go for about 10, 11, 12 days. And I mean, you are the second you wake up in the morning, we do start with devotion. Yeah. We start with, with the word of God. We yeah. start with a little bit of worship, but then we hit the ground running Wow! and that could look like midnight. It could look like mm-hmm. one, two, three. It just depends mm-hmm. because the activity that's happening is happening at a later time. But most of your intel, because intel drives the operations that we're able to do. And so you're looking and you're doing, I mean, hours upon hours and hours of research. Wow. But the hard thing is, is that as you're doing research, you're um, compiling a pattern of life for this person, mm-hmm. but then you're getting emerged into their lives. Yes. You start realizing, wow, her biological mom died when she was 14. Mm-hmm. And that's when she went into foster care. Mm-hmm. And this is when this all began. You know, like you start realizing and then it's when you meet them. Yeah. And my favorite part is being able to wrap my my arms around them. That's my absolute favorite part of it all. Um, because you're just able to be heart to heart with these kids who yeah. you have lost sleep over, who you have prayed for, that you have inter you know, it's just it's it's a it's a beautiful moment. Um, and that's where the focus has to be. It literally has to be one one child, one soul at a time. Wow. And when you look at it in that way, mm-hmm. you may not change the world, right? but that one person, you know. If you so, are rescuing yeah. one life from abuse absolutely, and trafficking, I mean, that is worth it. It is, is absolutely worth, worth it. All yeah. of the time and energy that is yeah. spent. And unfortunately, you know, when we're even looking at America counselors, th- there is a, a significant lack of training. Mm-hmm. Um, in standards when it comes to the, the child that is being sex trafficked. Um, there are some good trauma focused mm-hmm. cognitive behavior therapies sure. that they're, they're coming up with, but this is not a new issue. Right. And so if you, if you actually think about it, I, I just recently did some research cause I'm like, where did this even begin? And the criminal law amendment act in 1885 in Europe was created to attack the issue of trafficking as a new form of international crime. Really? 1885. So this, I mean, obviously. So what, 140 years ago? Obviously, you know? yeah, human trafficking, even, you know, 400 years ago, we're talking about slaves. The first, right. what, 20 that, that landed in the United States, um, that was human trafficking and some of it was sexual. But it's amazing to then, then think about the fact that in 1885 right. it was so even though um slavery had been abolished from from Africa right right the african atlantic slave trade that it was still going on mm-hmm. in some capacity and this is more specific sex trafficking okay. so this is not even just human trafficking to wow. where we're seeing the slave trade yeah. in Oregon, yeah. harvesting and all of those kind of things. Wow. We're, we're talking actually about the sex. And in trafficking. 1885, they, yes. that was that a Absolutely. Law. Wow. And, and the term sex traffic, so anybody who is under the age of 18, hmm. it is considered the definition then would be sex trafficked. A- engaging in any type of sexual activity. Commercial. Commercial. Well, commercially. Okay. So anytime there's coercion, um, force, fraud. Any of those things. And we're talking and pornography, 18, pornography as well as sexual Absolutely. acts. Absolutely. Wow. It is considered trafficking. Now, on top of that, though, you can still, anybody who's being still forced or okay. coerced, even after the age of 18, it's sex we would consider it to be sex, sex trafficking. trafficking. Okay. Or and, traffic. and we don't really use the, the terminology prostitution and, and all of these different things because when you, re, when you realize Okay, even if somebody's 23 years old, That's where did right. this start? That's right. Where did the trauma start? Where were they sinned against that it, caused them to, it, to do this? You it's know? not a, it's not a, a, as has been said before, they don't wake up thinking, I'm going to be a prostitute. Absolutely. Yeah, no, absolutely and not. It's, so it's something that has come out of something else, some Correct. lifestyle, some trauma, possibly younger, possibly older. Right, of course. And it is all a form of, of sex, sex trafficking. Correct. Wow. Correct. How can, 
What are the numerous ways? So obviously I, I can just picture, you know, there are some people who are hearing this going, man, I want to, I want to, I want to do that. Exactly. Like I want to be yes. on the task force. <laughs> I want to be there. I've got yes. these skills or whatever, but there are really multiple ways to be involved from, you know, becoming a foster parent, right? To uh, absolutely. There are a lot of, what are some of the ways that, that there we can. There is a plethora. So I, I think at the very basic level is prayer. Yeah. Because we can't do anything without that. Right. Um, secondly, there are a lot of organizations, and, and I do think that having good research, because mm -hmm. that has been a hurdle for our organization, you know, our nonprofit, is, is to prove that what we're doing is effective. And the beautiful thing is that because we're so mission-minded when we're yeah. out there, we have touched the lives of police officers who wow. may have been doing this for 15 years and they came in tears wow. to their supervisors saying this group of people, That's what awesome. they're doing, this is, this is the right way right. because they're seeing lives transformed right. and not just a found. Yes. And so uh, do I think that we're the only organization doing it right? Absolutely not. Do I think that we're one of the organizations doing it extremely well? Yeah. Absolutely. And so donations could always be made free international. Okay. Um, there is definitely a website and there is a way to give because okay. we, we do need yeah, funding. I mean, absolutely. the reality of it is right now we all spend our personal money basically. So you can become a U.S. missionary. Okay. And, and, and those Raise are funds funding, through, correct through as a missionary. Correct. But for those of us who are not yet. Who are volunteers. Um, yes. You I'm pay spending, your own I'm way. spending money to go do this, you know, so we're, we're buying plane tickets and That's food and Airbnbs right and there. all of these yeah. things. So for me and my husband to go, yeah, yeah, it, 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 it's it costs a couple of thousand dollars yeah. to go do this. Right. Um, and so, yeah, we're definitely not getting, we're not getting paid. We're, we're paying, <laughs> you know, to, to go do this. And so yeah. funding is definitely something yeah. that is needed. Um, but on the, on the side of that, there are, um, opportunities to to do missions trips mm -hmm. especially when we are in vegas and okay. so probably the the best way to contact is through the free international website okay um because there is a contact us way of doing that and that is something that gets sure. responded to yeah um and then i think on a more local level if you're like hey what can i do like you said absolutely CASA workers yeah. we need people and and one of the, the and children explain that I, CASA for those who don't know so a CASA worker is a court appointed, oh my goodness, I'd have to look up the acronym. Is it like advocate? Yes. Yeah. So what so, they basically do, it is a court appointed, but it's volunteers. Right. And so they will be assigned to foster children who will then work as a mediator between social worker, court, and child. Right. And so while the social worker may have hundreds yes. of children, I mean, they- Yes. They're overwhelmed. They are absolutely Systems overwhelmed. Is, is the inundated. system, yeah. absolutely. And so it is so difficult for- social workers. Um, and so when you have a CASA volunteer, they maybe will take on just a couple of kids and sure. they are the ones that are just making sure that there is access mm -hmm. for this child with their social worker or other, other things that they may need while they're in the foster care system. They become or, like a mentor, almost yeah, like a big absolutely. brother or big sister. Absolutely. Yeah. Whether that be the foster care system mm -hmm. or the reality is there's so many homeless youth yeah. shelters. Right. And so they're able to, to, to work alongside and advocate for mm -hmm. them because you, you think of a child who's trying to navigate life yeah, right. with a social and, worker and I'm living in a homeless yeah. youth. And, and get out of the system. Like, Correct. how do I get out of the system? Exactly. And you've got a social worker who's got hundreds who is looking out for me, right? Absolutely. Yeah, wow. absolutely. And you know, it's crazy. That this one child that we found last year, she was like, I didn't even, she was missing for two and a half years. Oh, and she was like, I didn't even think anybody was looking for me. Oh, my and I was gosh. like, well, God sent us to look for you, babe. Yeah. yeah. And I still have a relationship with her. So that's amazing. And she is now an adult ed and she's getting an education. Wow. She's in an approved home, even though it is kind of a friend. It's better than being Absolutely. in. Because the reality, so here's the reality. This is what's so difficult is that if you put a youth child in a youth homeless shelter mm -hmm. with other youth who yes. are or who are struggling yes. too. Yes. The yes. reality is they almost so especially if some of these are being trafficked themselves, they will go into yes. those group homes and then recruit basically. Yes. Right. And so it's statistically 
it's scary too for these children to even go to these homeless shelters. It's not safe for them. Absolutely not. So if we can placement that is done in these situations, mm-hmm. would they be placed in like small town USA? Mm-hmm. Maybe wouldn't be approved. But then sure. you, th- they're really good at looking at the full picture mm-hmm. of what is the most safe for this mm-hmm. child. And that was the reality for her. And so she is living in a home that at least she's in touch with her social worker. Right. She's going to school to get right. her education. And so for her life, it, yeah. it has definitely changed. And the reality of this little girl is that she actually wrote her suicide note that day. Oh my gosh. And we found her that day. And so to th- and she was like, I was so hopeless. And so we played, actually it was Brad who came with us for this one. And he played Lauren Dago's rescue. Yeah. And every word, it's just like, it hits on such a different level of, you know, you are not forgotten, no. you know, and we're, we're here, you know? And so just to be able to tell somebody who otherwise maybe never had biological parents who cared, um, who's in this system that, that have is so overran by, by just the influx, you know, of, of children who are truly homeless, um, knowing that somebody is looking for them yeah. means so much, you know? And so I think that on a, on a very church level, being willing to be a, a cost of volunteer. If, yeah. if, if having a child within your home mm-hmm. is not a reality and, and here's the reality. If you have other children and you're bringing, yeah. I, I hate to say it that sure, way because it's there so are heartbreaking some, to say that, but they have so your, many traumas. You, your, your number one responsibility yeah. is to protect absolutely. your, your household first. Absolutely. And so if, if realizing that that would, would disrupt your other mm. children who still really mm-hmm. need you being a cost of volunteer is a good alternative. Yeah. But if you do have the capabilities mm. of becoming an approved foster family and yeah. you're willing to take teenagers, oh, it which will most be people are not, it will be difficult. <laughs> you know, and, and you have to right, and you have to look at that. Yes. <laughs> You have to look at the entirety of the picture, right? Yeah. Because it's going to require, yeah. but I mean, to change the absolute trajectory of somebody's life and expose them to the love of Christ and change their life. I can't even imagine being that age. And I had a really ch- rough yeah. um, childhood. My dad passed away at 16 after um, a drug addiction that he had to Oxycontin after back surgeries. But I had an incredible mother who mm. fought for me. But I was 15 years old and had ran away and we were going to New Orleans. Wow. I don't know what would have happened then. And we had pagers then, not cell phones. <laughs> Way <laughs> back. A little bit of my age. <laughs> and my grandmother's number came across it. Mm. And it broke my heart because I, I was raised with my grandmother. I absolutely yeah. adored her. And so we made the decision to kind of go home, me and another girl. But the group that we were with were older people who was wanting to bring us, oh, let's go to New Orleans. And, oh, my god! And I made the decision to go home. Oh, my god! And so I think about. What if you hadn't had that absolutely. grandmother and that mom? I know. And so I had people who fought for me. But what if I wouldn't have? Yeah. You know, I don't even know. I don't know where I would be. And so, um, sorry. <laughs> yeah. To think about a child who doesn't have that. Right. It's heartbreaking, you know. Um, and so doing this work while it is so hard, it's so hard emotionally, it's hard physically, it's hard spiritually. Right. You are exposed to just a side of darkness that for the most part within our church culture, we don't even understand how dark this really is. Right. Um, however, <laughs> knowing that you have truly changed at least one life. Yes. And then another life and another life. I mean, it, it's worth it. You know, yeah. it's worth it to me um, to go through the heartache of it all. Um, to know that, that there has been a life that has been, that has truly been changed, yeah. you know, and that they know they have this crazy Louisiana mama, <laughs> you know, who, who is praying for them, who loves them. And I mean, even the girl that I have a relationship with from last year, you know, I'll send her money here and there and, you know, she'll need minutes on her phone. So we make sure to pay that. And then the agreement was, we'll continue to put minutes on your phone as long as you stay in such yeah. with us. And so that's been a relationship that we have continued that otherwise she would have ended her life. Wow. And, and I believe that God has such a big calling in her life, you know, and I, I don't know what she's going to become, you know, but to think that, um, 
she might have otherwise not had that chance. It, it, it makes it worth it. It really does. Um, so I think that for us not staying ignorant to what's really happening um, in our backyards and, and to really, um, you know, it, it's one thing to be emotionally affected by this. But it's another thing to put some movement to it. That's right. And like I said, even if, if that's a, a true commitment of prayer mm-hmm. or just saying, you know what, I, I can't, I'm not in a position to be able to go. Um, Jai's great aunt, you know, my husband's yeah. aunt, she was like, you know, I can't do this, but I love that y'all do. So I'm sending you a check. Oh, you know what I'm saying? It. Like, so I, I realized that yes. not everybody can do this, yes. but there, there may be. Um, There's some the possibility. Way yes, absolutely. Everybody can get involved. Absolutely. There is some way. And, and, if, and if, yeah, absolutely. And should. Yeah. Tiffany, I, I, I just, there are no words. Um, an incredibly heartbreaking situation, mm-hmm. truly heartbreaking. And yet I love how your heart has not just been broken for this, but a move mm-hmm. to action. Yeah. And that this, you are, you are making a real difference. You know, I think sometimes in ministry, we wonder, and even without ministry, you're you're there raising your kids and you're thinking, what am I doing with my life? And an opportunity to literally rescue somebody from the, from not just, uh, I mean, yes, ultimately hell, but rescuing them in a real tangible way from life and death and so beautiful. And I, I just so appreciate you sharing. I so appreciate you doing and, and bringing this even more, mm-hmm. um, uh, to, to light to more people. Yeah. Um, I, I do yeah. want to add one more thing yeah. before we're done. Um, and so for anybody who's hearing this and they're wondering, how do I protect my own children? Yes. Because that is a reality right? that our own children, when we allow our children to yeah. bring access to the world mm. that looks like through my phone, mm. through my iPad into my bedroom. Yes. Um, I, we have to have safeguards. Right. And so Bark is an amazing app okay. that you're able to put on your phone. It, it costs $14 a month to me. That is 100% worth it. What is it? So Bark is an app that you put on your phone, but then you also apply it to your children's devices. Okay. Like I said, $14.99, I think, a month. However, I mean, I don't work for Bark. Like, I'm not getting anything <laughs> for this. Just, just want y'all to know. I don't get any royalties because of this. Um, but it, it is, it, it's important. So basically it will monitor all of social media okay. and it will also monitor text messaging. Now you're not able to see, it's not, um, you know, you're going to, and, and looking at every single text messages sure. that your children have. Sure. However, it has code words okay. that, that it's it, looking it, for. It, yes. Okay. And the algorithms are always kind of changing because if you have somebody who's trying to write even just the word sex, mm. it's a five. An E, oh. you know, so they'll, they'll, they'll change. They'll look for yes, all of absolutely. That. Good. And so, but it's, it's, it's improving in a way that it will recognize mm-hmm. those types of things. Mm-hmm. And so if anybody would send any text messages, mm-hmm. whether that's a group message yeah. or even just a text yeah. message to your children, yeah. or they are trying to, to look for them. And I mean, the reality is, is through direct messaging, like on Instagram Mm -hmm. or instant messaging on Facebook and places like that. It will monitor all those things. Not only that, it will make sure that your children are not looking at pornographic images. Um, It also monitors things like YouTube. Mm -hmm. What are the videos? So um, my son, I mean, he's 15 years old, but he'll play video games. And so sometimes he'll watch YouTube videos and it has some violence on sure. it, but no, nothing that's yeah. not appropriate for right, 15. Right. I mean, he's not playing the crazy yeah. video games. It's very monitored. Yeah, right, right. Um, but if there's any violence yeah. at all, it will flag Being it. Notified. If there's any conversation about suicide, mm. uh, taking life or any, any code words, whether wow. that be a YouTube video, social media, right. text messages, right. it will flag it. Wow. And it is sent it to your phone so that you're able to view it. Wow. And so... Um, I think that it is our responsibilities as parents, especially yes. when we're we're giving. And look, my children have iPhones and iPads. Sure, I mean, sure. they do. However, making sure that we're putting safeguards mm-hmm. for them, right. because with the school assemblies, there has not been one school, not one, and they do school assemblies all over the place. And by the way, if you work for a school system, and you're like, hey, I have all of these schools that I would like school assemblies. We could do that too. Awesome. Um, but if uh, it, it, it never fails. And I, I did go do school assemblies with them and my heart was broken even then. 
there's always somebody who comes forward. Wow. At every school. Every school. Every single school. Whether that be suicidal ideation. Um, there was a huge bus, I guess, in our area um, because... A child decides to come forward and said, this is happening in my home. Oh, my gosh. And it was proven to be true. And and they were able to catch um, stepdad mm. and arrest. And so um, the reality is that even if this is not happening within your own children, there may be friends that they know that yeah. they know that this could be happening. Sure. And and there has been a case where the dad forced his daughter to basically recruit others oh my gosh and so as much as we don't ever want to think something like that right. we have to think logically right. about these things and so if we're going to give access to our children yeah. knowing who they're with right knowing where they're going right, right. um knowing the people that live yes. within the household but then also always allowing them a way out yes having and, and i it's so hard to look at your innocent children and tell them the reality of this horrible world sometimes, right. you know, but we do them no service either right. by not educating them, especially on something that yeah. is it has so to be important. talked about. It Absolutely. just, it has to be talked about. Absolutely. We could put safeguards, but then just having that open that dialogue with our children, Absolutely. We, we have to, Absolutely. you know, that is the, I, I believe it's just our responsibility because this is happening. Yeah. And so ignoring it doesn't make it go away. And I mean, not even when we're thinking about just sex trafficking, but uh, pornography, Absolutely. how prevalent that is, even within yes. our churches. Yes. And so if we have the safeguards and we have the conversations, mm -hmm. then we can, we can protect yes. our, our sons and our daughters, you know, so. Oh, Tiffany, thank you so much for sharing. I, this again, such an important thing. And I, you are purposely now in grad school. Yes. Pursuing mental health, mental, uh, mental, clinical mental health counseling, yes. counseling with kind of more of that concentration in trauma, trauma crisis yes. for this, for this reason. Correct. And your heart's passion and, and that to, the, your heart is beating for these, these yes. children. And it's so clear. And I, I so am so grateful for you and what you're doing in this ministry and just being able to share it. And uh, Free International is the ministry that you're part of. Yes. Um, and again, you can you can look it up, explore it, find ways to get involved, find ways to uh, educate yourself, find ministry opportunity. And there are a lot of them out there. Um, but I, I love this idea, again, of, of this boots on the ground doing yes. it. Um, and get involved, even if it's just money, even yeah. if it's just prayer, uh, of finding ways to do this. And so again, thank you so much You're for welcome. being, for being on. Well, this has been the Nefesh podcast episode 31, uh, episode 31. I hope that you have been gripped by the reality of this and that this has, that this is weighing on you to action, not to overwhelm us but to break there's a great line in one of my favorite worship songs by hill song that where where they say break my heart god for what breaks yours this is breaking god's heart and it should break ours how can we get involved pray and ask the lord to guide you into how you can do that and do it get involved and we'll talk to you next time